All right, welcome everybody. I want to um, excited to have my good friend Dr. Datis Karajian here. We were just chatting about how we've known each other since 1995. It's crazy how time flies, isn't it? Yeah, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and for those of you, you guys got to know who Dr. Karajian is. He is one of the top people in the world, and I don't say that just because I'm his friend. It's even if I didn't know him, it's absolutely amazing. Someone who's revolutionized. Um, thyroid care and the model for, for treating thyroids with his 2010 book, Why Do I Still Have Thyroid Symptoms When My Lab Tests Are Normal? And then also with treating the brain with, uh, with his great book, uh, Why Isn't My Brain Working? So Dr. Karazian, in addition to being a chiropractor, he's also got a PhD from Harvard Medical School. Um, he's also got a doctorate of health sciences, multiple different degrees. We were just talking that you're saying this is the first time you haven't been in school in 23 years, right? Yes, it's 23 years. I didn't get my, I got my PhD from the Department of Healthcare Science at Nova Southeastern University. I got my Master of Medical Science at Harvard and I'm a PhD. Oh, okay. I did got my it. postdoc there. So just. Got it. It's still, it's still, we're not worthy. We're yeah, not yeah. worthy. It's, <laughs> it's still some amazing stuff. So I've also invited people to, um, ask questions here on the side so we can really kind of customize, you know, what to make this really what you guys want to learn about. And, uh, Dr. Ray Jin saying hi to you, Detise. Hey, Ray, good to see you. We're here to have you on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So I know, Detise, one of the biggest thing I have people asking me right now is with COVID, uh, people who have autoimmunity, is they're really worried, like, you know, how is COVID affecting with autoimmunity? Are they more likely to get something? Is there something that you need to be worried about with that? Sure. So it's not going to be the same for every autoimmune disease. And, and, I, and I, I can only speak to the relation of what happens with viral infections, which are pretty much the same. So it's not specific to COVID-19, but for the most part, if you have an autoimmune disease, you do have some risk for infection if your white blood cell count drops or if your NK cells are dysfunctional or if your B cells are dysfunctional. So like when we look at autoimmune disease patients, we'll do an immunology workup and we'll do a profile called the TNB cell profile where we break down their different individual immune cells. So generally speaking, if you have an autoimmune disease and you've had blood work and your white blood cells are low, then you, you do have a risk for any infection, not just COVID-19. Yeah. And then... Um, Sometimes the white blood cells look good, but then when you actually look at the individual function of the immune cells, you can see like natural killer cells are very depressed. That's the main um, immune cell used to fight viruses. So not all, all autoimmune disease patients have immune suppression. Um, they may have an overactive immune system. And for some people, they have an overactive immune system, which actually give some, gives them some degree of protection, despite the fact they're getting chronic inflammation and, and, and uh, having severe inflammation and severe reactions from that. So it's going to be different. Some people have yeah. protection. Some people will be just as much risk as everyone else. And some people will have increased risk because of immune dysregulation. So that's how it is with all viruses. Um, so COVID-19 will probably be the same. And, and we, as you mentioned in their low white blood cells, like the ranges that you talk about are oftentimes different than what they would have on their standard medical tests. So what would you consider something that could be low that they need to look at? And how would they address that? Let's say if, they're immune, if their white blood cells are low, what would you recommend for, for a patient? So, I mean, for the, for the most part, you just want to, with white blood cells, you really want to just look at the lab range. So the lab range for most people will be five will be um, the high end and, and uh, three, you know, anything once it gets below 3.5, it's, 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 there's some significant risk um, for, for getting infections. So most laboratories will have a range between 3.5 to 5 as a normal range. And the functional range isn't much different from that, um, which is a more critical range for like ideal, uh, maybe an ideal mid lane, mid 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 range, but once uh, once uh, once you start getting below that three point five range or even even slightly below four, um, yeah, your immune system is it's more at risk. Now, how do you increase that? There's yeah. no good answer because um, it's really what what's the key thing for your autoimmunity. So there's necessarily a supplement you would take. Because some supplements can actually trigger the autoimmune response to get the white blood cells up. And for other people, it may just be need to they need to get sleep, or they need to get rest, or they need to uh, improve improve their health in, in general. And I, and, and I think you know this, but I made an mm -hmm. immune resilience program just talking about diet and lifestyle of things to try to generally support your immune system uh, with just like getting enough hydration, getting enough sleep, getting enough rest. Um, and uh, people can check that out, Dr. K News, uh, and it's, you can download it for free, but it's the basic concepts. So wow. there is no specific protocol to get your white blood cells up. It's just a matter of um, fixing your underlying issues. Right, right. And then you also have your 3D program as well, too. Yeah, yeah the 3D immune tolerance program is really a, a purchase program. It talks about how to support your um, 
immune system, how to modulate it. Lots of videos, and we had to put a lot of time into that yeah. development. So it's so it's not free, but there's videos and course material and recipe guides and and things like that. But the immune resilience one we just put together quickly just to give uh, to, just to give people some direction with lifestyle, which is really the most important part. I think people neglect. Yeah. Like, like right now, we all see people social distancing. And then turning into alcoholics. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know what's really bad? When I went, I went through Trader Joe's the other day, and I got all of my food, and I and I push it up there. And I'm really selective in what, what we're getting, making sure I'm getting good things to try to you know support my body, yeah. and, and not even though there's a temptation just to eat everything that's just you know feel good, opioid inducing kind of foods. I push the cart up, and the ladies. You know, loading it up and she looks she's like oh wow you're the first person today who didn't load up on alcohol and I thought that's a, she was actually shocked she's like do you have a large supply at home I'm like no no, no I'm really just trying to avoid it during this time because I don't want to you know suppress my immune system and if you can talk about that too what how does alcohol impact your immune system uh, in, in general and especially during this time because I do have a lot of friends who are you know kind of the impression that, oh well you know this is going to actually help me with the with the coronavirus um, I've sure. seen those memes going around. <laughs> tequila, tequila kills it, you know. <laughs> I mean, if, if you take a technical look and, and look at the research on alcohol, um, it's really more, mostly where you see immune suppression is from binge drinking. Okay. The three days in a row of binge drinking is when they actually see the barrier system break down, immune system break down. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you're just having some wine with dinner at night or something, I mean, it's not going to be a major issue. Um, some keyword is some, not some, so many bottles, right? <laughs> I mean, if you're drunk every single night yeah, right. throughout the day, then your immune system may play, play, uh, play, 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 play for that. And then barrier systems do break down with chronic alcohol exposure, blood, brain, barrier, gut barriers. But there again, most of the studies I've read and, and looked at this, I did a literature on this uh, just this year on it. And it was, it was really, a, and the, once you get to about three days of consistent uh, abuse. Three days is when it starts. So to you got to take some breaks. You got to take some breaks. So, so two, two days on, one day off, intermittent drinking basically is, is the recommendation. Yeah, oh, makes sense. Uh, now let's tie this back into going back to foods because I know one of the things you talk about is that it's important for people to get a diversity of, of, of foods. And I know in my clinic as we work with people who have autoimmunity, you know, we run the tests from Cyrex Labs and they can really freak out on, oh my God, I react to this, that, and the other thing. Um, I feel like I can't eat anything anymore. Uh, what is your advice on that? Because I know you say if you don't introduce different foods and have a broad variety, it can be problematic right. as well. Yep. So I think one of the things I just started to see happen and uh, was when people were developing autoimmunity, they would usually find out that at some point they, they couldn't eat certain foods, they would have reactions. And I remember when I first had out of practice before, there was autoimmune paleo and all these different mm -hmm. uh, trendy diets and books out there just seeing patients come in really, really sick. And they were just basically brought their own food. They had a Tupperware. Mm -hmm. It was basically what we call today an autoimmune paleo diet. It's, and it was not really based on theory. It was based on this is the only thing I can eat to survive and function. And working with chronic patients, we, you know, we always had to find hotel rooms that were safe for them chemical right. wise. And they had to be able to cook their own foods in there. So we had like this email list. We still use when patients come in. But back then, before all this became popular and more research had come out, it was pretty clear that um, patients that autoimmunity had a very limited diet. Yeah. The problem is that what we see is now that it's become more popular and more trendy and people are understanding more things like gluten sensitivity and doing more testing, and most people that have autoimmunity immediately start to go like on a gluten-free diet, um, then they just go, what's the next food? Because I feel so much better avoiding that. And then they go into the next food and then pretty much, you know, they have like cut down everything or... Yeah. They'll just go into a very strict autoimmune paleo diet, which is gluten free, dairy free, grain free, nightshade free, lectin free. Yes, right. And, and um, fun free. <laughs> but and some people absolutely have to do that because yeah. it's trigger for them. But what happens when they limit their diet is they just kind of get used to eating the same food over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we saw that, we would see patients with their immune panels, and uh, they would just have you you'd run a food sensitivity panel. And they would show up for like every, like a third of the food panel would be positive. Yeah. So that to us is an indication that they've lost what they call immunology, loss of tolerance, loss of oral tolerance to be specific. And then we noticed if we just, if they just rotated to the new foods, then the next time we tested them, they would just show positive for those foods. And it was an ongoing trend is that people with autoimmune disease would just notice they can't, they, they were losing their ability to eat more and more food over time. Right. And part of that, you know, he's like, maybe they have leaky gut. Maybe the leaky gut's getting worse. But when we were testing that, that's not what was happening. The leaky gut was not getting worse. They were, the leaky gut was healing, and they're still getting more and more food reactivities. So then I remember thinking, like, what what is happening? So I remember just trying to 
learn about what, what would possibly it. And that's when I got exposed to the field of oral tolerance in the journals, um, immunology journals as a topic. And I'm like, oh my God, there's so much more than leaky gut. Testimony yeah. is just part of it. So dendritic cells and regulatory T cells and uh, Cooper cells and how the gut and the liver interact and, and all these different uh, pathways are critical, SIGA levels. So based on that, I did a literature review and looked at all the different mechanisms that impact immune tolerance from diet and lifestyle. And I started implementing that in my patient population and encouraging them to actually eat a diverse food because one of the key things with um, your immune system and immune tolerance is that you have to have lots of different vegetable fibers, diverse vegetable fibers to keep your microbiome diverse. So that's when I created the oral tolerance program. And then we yeah. go, well, let's name this because someone's going to rip this off. Yeah. <laughs> always happens. <laughs> always happens. Yeah. So then, so then we trademarked it 3D and the 3D yeah. stands for diverse, distinguish, and downregulate, which yeah. is the, the, the key principles that uh, was based on the program I developed for my patients. And that's what the that's what the immune tolerance program is. But I would say the biggest mistake most people with autoimmune disease make is they they start to limit their diet and keep eating yeah. the same meal every day, and then they get worse. Well, I remember uh, one of the things you told us in one of the courses I took from you is like, go to like the Asian supermarket and find some yeah. weird vegetable that looks funny that you've never eaten before, and add that in. And that's what I started, you know, trying to do to try to introduce these different things in there. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. And how, how it just to just be an ongoing thing, right? Trying to introduce some new, some yeah. new foods in small amounts and get a wide variety on it. Right. Yeah. Now, now going along with that too, I've had some, some people ask this question too, because we know, you know, with iodine, it's such a hot topic and um, iodine in foods versus iodine in, in supplements for um, patients with Hashimoto's. Uh, yeah. I even had one patient ask a question, what if they have like a cancerous nodule and they want to do radioactive iodine? Is that a risk for them to have that done to where could that trigger a big thyroid storm? So maybe if you can kind of talk about that because I know it's a hot, hot potato topic. Yeah. Actually, I just did a very thorough literature review this past few months because I in the Hashimoto's course I'm teaching, I have a whole section on iodine related to diet. So I can tell you there's been lots of new studies published this past year that are just game changers. Yeah. And, and, and it's gone to the point now they have three, they've done three studies, clinical trials, where they actually removed iodine from their diet. So, so put it simply, um, if, you, if you had no personal bias of like nutrition and you were just a scientist, Mm -hmm. you were, let's say you were a scientist and you go, I have Hashimoto's, I'm sick. Mm -hmm. Should I take iodine? If you went and looked at all the evidence, it would be overwhelming that iodine supplementation is a trigger. Taking exogenous iodine or even taking iodine salt, which they've done in many countries, uh, is a trigger. There's, there's no question about it. They've done uh, retroact. They do, they've done um, clinical trials where they looked at people. They've done epidemiological studies. They've done uh, retrospective studies, prospective studies. There's so many different versions of how they've looked at this research question. Yeah, it, it is absolutely a trigger. They've done histological studies. They see significant inflammatory reactions with small exposures. So, um, if you know, if you, it's almost to the point, if you're giving Hashimoto's patients iodine, it's, it's really borderline medical malpractice. Yeah. And then the question becomes, what about diet? So they've done three studies now where they reduced iodine dietary intake. And all three had a positive response in the subjects where iodine tend to, uh, when they re reduced their intake, their Hashimoto's went into remission and the inflammatory response came down, TSH levels normalized. And, you know, what people don't understand is you only need a very little amount of iodine in your diet to make thyroid hormones. It's, some tr it's a trace amount. It's like the amount of a pinhead a day, which you can get if you eat vegetables and yeah. other types of foods. And, and when they denied on uh, restriction, it was a big change. And then even furthermore, they found that goitrogenic foods, which everyone is supposed to avoid foods that can compete with iodine uptake, um, in the Hashimoto's population is completely, is very protective. It actually protects, <laughs> it protects them from their autoimmune flare-ups. And they've used concentrated amounts of goitrogenic things like broccoli, compound yeah. extracts, and they fed it to Hashimoto's mm -hmm. patients. And they found that it, it turned, raised glutathione levels in their thyroid and less... Wow. Iodine and then the iodine uptake issue may actually be protective. 
and they found like yeah so basically it's a complete switch like yeah. you know, 10 years ago 15 years ago if you were a nutritionist or functional medicine doctor a patient came with a thyroid disorder you gave him iodine you gave him a full list of goitrogens now it's like you do the opposite you, t- you avoid the iodine and you give him a goitrogen again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> amazing how research can change and uh and with that i see some people are asking you know so what about iodine in a supplement like in a multivitamin because i know playing devil's advocate you're going to have those others out there that say oh well once i took the iodine i felt great i had extra energy so if you can address that because that's the question i see people ask all the time and i'd love you to share your answer with yeah. them um and I, I talk about that in the hush moves course but uh basically uh i made some slides that sure really show the mechanism the bottom line is if you're going to take iodine you should get a baseline tpo and thyroid globin antibody test and then take it mm-hmm. what you're going to see happen is you're going to see your antibody counts going to skyrocket i don't mean go up i mean skyrocket yeah and that's letting us know that's letting you know that you have triggered your autoimmune inflammatory response when you trigger autoimmune inflammatory response against your thyroid gland, you actually break down tissue, and that tissue contains thyroid hormones. So a lot of people feel better. Yeah, actually, they're actually getting a little thyroid hormone boost when they're getting that small degree of flare-up from the iodine. Yeah, but when you look at their antibody count, it's off the chart. Yeah, so that would be the key thing. So I would say that's one thing to look at. Um, if you if you're like if you're like a skeptic and go, I don't care what anyone says, I've taken iodine, I feel better, then you should do this. Get your baseline TPO, thyroglobin antibody. Go off iodine. See if they change. You should change within a week. Then go back on and see what happens. And if you get a flare-up, then you know that you're probably getting an adverse reaction from it. There's probably a population of people that can handle it and doesn't do anything to them, just like every mechanism yeah. of disease. But uh, majority of people will have adverse reactions. And I think an important thing to point out there too is something I remember you talking about in your courses is that a lot of people don't know that those TPO antibodies can cross react with the cerebellum. So, I mean, to me, that is so huge because, and I see as people are asking questions here too, that people are asking about brain fog and Hashimoto's. And I see so many of my Hashimoto's patients who come in because they'll come in to, to get me to do laser for them, laser transcranially, because they're not, oh my God, I got this, I got brain fog, I understand it. And then we'll test them, we see the termination tremors, and we'll see things like difficulty swallowing you know or they need to have everything as a liquid or as a powder and they have no idea of what is going on with the thyroid and the brain so if you could address that too that'd be great yeah so there's there's several layering mechanisms how Hashimoto's totally destroys uh, not destroys but creates an inflammatory response in the brain um, one of them is what you mentioned um, you know when you look at antibodies antibodies can bind to other tissue proteins once they, once they look at most antibodies, most, antib- most antibodies bind to more than one tissue. So because of the protein sequence of the other tissue being very similar to it. So TPO antibodies have been now clearly shown to bind to cerebellum. So if someone has Hashimoto's and their antibody levels are high, and especially if their blood-brain barrier is breached, that blood-brain permeability, then those circulating antibodies can not only attach to the thyroid, but they can attach to the cerebellum. That's one mechanism. Another common mechanism is that many Hashimoto's patients have celiac um, genes um, or have transglutamine A6 sensitivities to gluten, and those antibodies also have been shown to cross-react. Uh, gluten antibodies can cross-react. Cross-react means the antibody binds to the protein for those of you that are listening that don't understand that concept. So the antibodies bind to a tissue protein, and the tissue protein binds to it. it the immune system destroys it. So gluten and uh, TPO bind to the cerebellum, causes significant uh, degeneration inflammation there. And many Hashimoto's patients have both gluten sensitivity and, um, well, they all have TPO antibodies. So if the blood brain barrier is breached, their gut's inflamed, the combination of those things can really cause significant, for the most part, brain autoimmunity. There's also another phenomenon uh, in the literature called Hashimoto's encephalopathy, where yeah. patients get an acute flare up of their autoimmunity and they get delirium and they get uh, cognitive decline and they just look like they have a stroke. And they actually found two individual proteins in the brain that directly, that directly activated by TPO that caused that. And it's, it's really one of those things where if you have Hashimoto's, it's not just the thyroid, it's also the brain. Yeah, and, and you bring up a, a good point there too, when you're talking about like with celiac and with gluten. Now, what about two, two things? What about casein? And let's say you have someone who has taken a gluten reaction test and a casein test and they don't see a reaction on there, um, do they still need to avoid it or not? Well, technically, if you don't have the antibody, you can't have the cross-reactivity of molecular mimicry. Okay. So um, it depends on how much you trust the test. 
And then the other key thing is, you know, when you test, there's different immunoglobulins. So most, most labs will have IgG or IgM or IgA, and you can miss it unless you, if you test all three. Right. It's just better <laughs> to be safer. You really just want to avoid the cross-reactive foods. Um, gluten and dairy are cross-reactive with each other. So they can also trigger Hashimoto's, uh, even though a person's on a gluten-free diet, if they're still eating dairy, they may not feel better. That makes sense. I, I know when I initially took a uh, gluten test, it was not a Cyrex one, and I came back completely non-reactive. And then when I did the Cyrex panel that had the 24 different versions, then I was reactive on there. So I had a, you know, a poorer version of a test that made me think I was okay, where I could have been going on and eating things and triggering this gut destruction, brain destruction, et cetera. And now going from there too, as you mentioned, antibody tests, let's kind of tie it in with something timely here. What about the antibody testing right now for COVID? What are your thoughts on that? Is there any kind of one you would recommend? Like I know some are doing that uh, finger prick test that's out of South Korea that's ready in 15 minutes. Any idea on which ones are actually work and don't work? It's tough to say because when, you, when you're looking in the U.S., you can always kind of, um, everything's been fast tracked, so we don't have the same standards. Mm -hmm. So normally when a laboratory develops an antibody test, they go through CLIA, which is a licensing group or American College of Pathologists. Most legitimate labs have, credit, have both accreditations, like Cyrex, for example. They have both CLIA certification and the American College of Pathologists accreditation, which means they go through a standard operating procedures, they validate their tests, they get true positives, they compare the test to true positives, they get a reference range, and then they have to follow those steps in order to present, or they'll lose their laboratory accreditation. Those same standards don't apply in other countries. So we don't know like what they're doing and we're not sure if, uh, to be honest, I'm not sure what the standards are in Korea and what kind of validation they have with yeah. it. But in the U.S., we know we have those guidelines. And then in the U.S., I think the difficulty is even the labs can do it, trying to figure out the, the exact range. So, I mean, in the laboratory, you can go right now and get COVID-19 from a lab supplier, get the actual antigen. Uh, no problem. You can get every antigen in the world when you're in, in the laboratory <laughs> commercial uh, research areas. And then you can measure the antibody against a pretty straightforward procedure to do. It's no different for COVID-19 than any other virus. It's just a matter of getting the right range. So um, I think I think for the most part, they're figuring out the right range. And once they figure out the right range, and if you have high levels of the antibody, then you have some immunity. So IgM, for, 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 for antibodies determined with foods and viruses and path, they're all different. Mm -hmm. IgM with a virus means acute exposure and uh, IgG means uh, immunity. Okay. So if you have IgG levels of coronavirus off the charts, then you have technically immunity. And then, then when the world of immunity, there's some science about how much antibody counts you have to figure how much immunity you have. That's why they do booster shots but we don't know what that level is. Yeah. And so is, if it's just slightly up, and that, that model is also flawed because it's not just the level of the antibody that gives you immunity. So those are all the questions that are coming out. Now, I can tell you just really quickly, for us as sure, a family, my wife and my daughter, myself, like we go, hey, when do we feel comfortable traveling? What do you want right. to do this summer? And we're like, hey, well, I don't know. But I can tell you that if our antibodies are positive because we, we have some immunity, to it, then we don't have anything to worry about. Not your brain, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But you haven't been tested. You haven't found a good test that you would could say is you know something that. You would well, I think once they get once they get uh, some of the major lab players um, to that are already accredited, like if Lab Corp some of these labs offer the test, you know they're going to go through standards through CLIA and their culture okay. biologist, Then the levels are going to be pretty reliable. Gotcha. Uh, like you and I can. There was a person in San Diego that opened up a lab in the medical office and was offering the test. Yeah. And, they got caught and it was like fraud. Oh my God. Because he was just making his, his own ranges out of the blue and random. And uh, I'm not sure if there was no standard off procedures. No, they weren't following any standards established for a life antibody testing. So uh, that's the main issue we have is since there's been uh, a removal of the standards by the FDA and by, by establishing ranges, it's kind of, we're not sure yet. Yeah, it makes sense. Ed, let me ask you a question along those lines then. If we don't have a clear, clear test yet that can show definitively if someone has antibodies, let's say someone does have a job. No, uh, no. I think, I think, by the way, they do have it. They, they do have it. Just, they haven't released it yet. Haven't released it. Okay. So it hasn't been released yet. Uh, but let's say you got someone who's working like in healthcare or they're working at a supermarket or something and they're out there and they're, they're, you know, they're in contact with the public, et cetera. What would they need to do to try to make sure their family members are protected when they're coming home? You know, are there things that they can do to try to minimize their risk or minimize spreading it to other family members or any thoughts on that? 
I mean, it's the same thing with all viruses. Uh, I don't think it's any different. I think people just cleaning soap and soap kills it. And, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, there's so many other people that are experts on that besides me, but okay. I can tell you what we're seeing with the uh, uh, research is that basically the mortality rate is much lower than we thought because there's so yeah. many million people. So if the mortality rate, the one they studied in New York, and the mortality rate is showing to be 0.5% and the flu is 0.3%. That's not much different. Not, mu- not much, yeah. And, you know, Sweden didn't do all the serious social isolation things. And the epidemiologist there that runs the country health policy is a brilliant guy. He's one of the top epidemiologists of the world for pathogens and infections. And uh, he's like, nope, we're going to have herd immunity in May. And he goes, if you, he goes, I guarantee you, if you look at our data of deaths, this would seem higher now, a year from now, compared to other countries, we're going to be yeah. similar. So that makes a lot of sense because there are some people that are vulnerable. And you know, he, the point he was making is that when other countries start to open up the restrictions, then you're going to have death rates go up. And then right. at the end of the year, when you look at all the data and all the statistics, it's going to look pretty similar. But at the end of the day, we have to have, we have, to have uh, immunity the human species and that's yeah. just going to have its effect, you know? Yeah. It's going to make its way around one way or the other in, in essence, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Now I do uh, Mark has a question on this too. He says, what are your thoughts on what's causing the clotting and its impact on the blood when people who do have COVID-19? I don't know. I mean, I was just going to have something on fibrinogen or, or platelet activity that's, that's causing it. And it might be a different risk factor for one or the other. Mm-hmm. There's a paper that just showed like ferritin levels going up can determine whether you actually die from COVID-19 or not, which is an acute phase reactant. They're finding studies where they look at populate air, air, air pollution and they can find the hot spots of COVID-19 directly correlate with air pollution. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't, uh, it's going to, I mean, this is the thing is we need a year or two to look back and analyze all the data and research. Right. Um, we just did some research on our own. We we measured cross-reactive foods with COVID-19, and we measured cross-reactive tissue pathogens with cross-reactive. This is with myself, Dr. Vajdani. We're trying to finish those manuscripts and submit them right now. But certain food proteins can trigger if you have the antibodies because of the amino acid similarity, and then COVID-19 may have the potential to turn on certain autoimmune diseases because of cross-reactivity. So everyone's kind of in their specialty is trying to publish research. And the great thing is those journals are now. Um, you know, expediting the process, yeah. getting reviewers to commit to reading the journals sooner and respond to sooner. So there's been an unbelievable explosion of COVID-19 research happening that's that's never happened before because of this expedited process by all these journals. So it's pretty cool, but it's going to take time. Yeah, it is. And I've even seen that in my feel the specialty in lasers. We've seen a lot of research coming out with lasers and how they do affect like the immune response and all these different things related to COVID-19. So it'll be exciting to kind of see where that is in the near future, especially as we see that some of our traditional models may not be giving all the answers to you know what's, what's going on and how to best uh, help people with this. So in mind with that too, I had uh, another, a couple of people, a few people asked this question is, what about ketogenic diet for autoimmunity and is there a risk with going on and off of the ketogenic diet? Sure, I can answer that. Let me just ask one thing before I get into the ketogenic diet thing. I just want to say, like, ultimately what's going to happen is they're going to realize, I think the healthcare system can realize that your pre, pre-conditional health before an infection is the key thing. Yeah. The strategy of finding an infection is really not the way to go. Not right. So whether your antioxidant reserves are, your immune function is, your lung barrier, your gut barrier, your, that's going to be the key factor. And uh, microbiome diversity or tolerance, all those things are going to be key factors on your susceptibility to infections because it's not... The infection is definitely worse for those that have other pre pre inflammatory issues and so forth. So I think it's going to promote as we get into the post pandemic crisis, the acute phase. Yeah. Just how important it is to stay healthy and be treat the whole person versus a pathogen or infection. You know, there's. Yeah. One other thing to add to that before I get a ketogenic question. And the other thing too is they might not find the vaccine. Yeah. There's a lot of pathogens you cannot, they haven't developed vaccines for. The, the, the assumption is that if there's a virus that the, they can develop a, a, a virus, it's, it's incorrect. There's no SARS vaccine. There's no Ebola vaccine. There's, uh, they just started to come up with some things for hepatitis. They've been working on that for who knows how long. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a breakthrough in luck if they can yeah. even find a vaccine. And at the end of the day, if, whether that's going to be the key factor or not, 
it's how healthy you are because this won't be the only pathogen. But anyways. So yeah. So in a sense, it's really, we, we really have to shift our paradigm of thinking. Yeah. Our, our old way of saying, well, you're not sick, so you're healthy. Like I've noticed that with a lot of these people that say, oh, he or she had no underlying health conditions. But you look at them and you can see some signs just on the physical appearance. There were some things that were there. Maybe weren't diagnosed. Maybe there wasn't enough lab tests done. Maybe there was right. you know, smokers, vapors, not enough sleep stressful they're living yeah. in polluted areas you well, know exactly i think for most of us that work with chronic patients we'll see a person that comes in an athlete they look great they go i don't feel i feel awful and then yeah. you look at their lab test and they, they don't have healthy natural killer cells no. and they have complete intestinal barrier and they're reacting to every food but they don't have a disease so they like otherwise healthy and normal yeah but i think a lot of these people that are having complications or sick they just don't have a disease that's been diagnosed and identified um, now back to the ketogenic question. Okay, so sure. <laughs> you're not immunity yeah. uh, really quickly. Uh, so ketogenic diets um, may have a tremendous impact on, on autoimmunity simply because uh, insulin levels drop significantly uh, when people are on, in ketosis. And insulin is a major trigger for TH17 cells. So for a lot of people that have uh, um, especially blood sugar instability and they notice that when their blood sugar levels spike and when they get fatigued and tired of the eat, when they trigger their autoimmune flares up, those people would, would may feel better and function better in, in their autoimmune state if they're in a ketogenic diet. So going in and out of ketosis is probably something you should do normally. Um, you know, you should take breaks and then get out of ketosis, get back in. For some people, it's just not worth it. They're like, I don't want to do it. I feel so good in ketosis. I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to eat anything different. Right. Other people, they're like, I'll, I'll do this ketosis thing, but I need a break. And you're like, yeah. okay, well, when you need a break, they're like, I need one every week or I need one every month or I need one. I need one when I just need to break down for special occasions. Yeah. So you kind of figure out what works for them. And, um, and I, I think an important thing on there too is for people to know what foods they react to too. Because for example, my, my wife and I know, and Jeanette says, hi, thank you for everything too. So, <laughs> so, um, it, back, you know, when we were in chiropractic school, I did like the Atkins ketogenic diet, which was basically bacon and cheese, bacon, cheese, and eggs pretty much was yeah. heavy cream. I felt great. I dropped a ton of weight. Um, you know, my Hashimoto's antibodies disappeared, whereas my wife felt awful. And we always wondered, why did she feel awful? And I felt great. Well, years later, when we did the Cyrix testing, guess what she had? She had the milk antibodies. I didn't have the milk antibodies. So, and I think that's an important thing because you see some people are, are, are reacting to those milk. And let's see if they have the milk antibodies. Do they need to avoid butter? Uh, no, because it's not casein. Um, um, but the, the, some are extremely sensitive. So for me, what yeah. I do in my practice is technically when you're eating a butter, you're looking at the fat and not the yep. protein. It's the protein that triggers the response. So is a remnant fat uh, maybe for some processing uh, of butter for some, some manufacturers, or is there any contaminants uh, with, when they, with proteins when they did it? If that's the case, then it would be a trigger. But for yeah. most people, um, if they're reacting to casein, then butter is usually okay because they don't have, there's no casein. And butter, what about cheese? Well, cheese is, then the, cheese is definitely inflammatory because cheese is yeah. loaded with casein and it doesn't yeah. matter what kind. Okay. And then there was a study that was published where they looked at uh, goat cheese, uh, cow, camel milk, well, they looked at milk, which also correlates to cheese, but okay, camel milk, sheep milk, uh, human milk, almond milk, soy milk, all these different milks. <laughs> and I helped with the data analysis of the study, but um, it was interesting because they found that uh, human milk was less reactive. Really? <laughs> all, all of them had casein. Okay. So the, the degree of casein correlated with how much uh, uh, people reacted to it, um, how much inflammation they had. So it's really the casein content of milk. So, and goat's milk has it. So people are like, well, I can't do cow's milk, but I can do goat's. Like, you really can't. You're just not noticing the inflammation as much. <laughs> right. Right. That, make, that makes total sense. Now, going back to with the Cyrix testing too, I had one, one person just asked, is Cyrix going to come out with any kind of COVID testing? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I heard they're looking into it. And they, I know, I know Dr. Vajdani, the lead investigator, uh, has done it. He has his antibody, an antibody range and validated it. Um, but he's a brilliant immunologist. He can do whatever he wants in the lab. <laughs> he's yeah, at that level, right? Of course, yeah. So, <laughs> he can tinker, yeah. So he's like he's the main scientific advisor for Cyrex. Whether he, you know, whether Cyrex decides to do it or not, that's a different story. And I don't know what kind of legal and uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know. I, that's that's a good question for the lab. But okay, gotcha, gotcha. Now going along the lines with this, a lot of people are. 
talking about the role of toxins with brain function, with autoimmunity, et cetera. And there's so many different things out there people talk about. How can you test for them? And if you do test for them, what do you do for it? So if you can you know, kind of elaborate on, are there any good tests versus less reliable tests for toxins? And how would you know whether you even need to address them or do you leave them alone? Yeah. It's a good question. That's a big one. You can do a it's whole a seminar on that, right? It's a whole seminar. It's a whole <laughs> section of a seminar. <laughs> uh, for the most part, uh, you know, no one, no one should have pollutant in the toxins. The toxic load has a negative effect. And when they look at chronic inflammatory conditions and different diseases, whether it's cardiovascular or autoimmune, the higher toxin pollutant load you get exposed to from air quality and, and things you get exposed in your water determine your health. Yep. So just, just conventional public health research. The healthier your water is, the healthier air is, the healthier you are. So that's not even debatable, right? So that's mm -hmm. just a fact. Um, the other question is then like in a clinical setting, what about measuring? What about when someone's sick? What yeah. do you measure heavy metals? Do you measure toxins? What do you do? Hair tests, urine hair tests, tests, what kind of yeah. things? Yeah. So pretty much hair tests is unreliable okay. when you look at research. I mean, people are going to have their biases, but if you're just a, if you practice evidence-based medicine, you look at the mm -hmm. evidence, the hair, hair testing is unreliable. And the amount of toxins, first of all, it's not very effective in reproducibility. It's, there's a lot of difference from one lab to the lab. So that, that technology is flawed. Um, and then the other thing is hair content of heavy metals doesn't, doesn't have any correlation, doesn't have any direct correlation with body burden. So what you have in your hair may not really reflect what's actually in your body. And uh, it's, it's really such a waste of time and energy for someone to spend time, energy, and money to do that test. So it's kind of useless. Then you have uh, uh, urine tests, blood tests, stool tests <laughs> to measure toxins and, and so forth. So it depends on what your goals are. And then you also have antibody tests. So yeah. like in a blood test, you can measure the level of the, uh, the chemical, whether it's like mercury or lead, but you can't measure a lot of chemicals in blood. You're limited to what's available. There's a lot more things you can measure in urine. Urine directs to correlate to a total load. So you can measure like bisphenol A in the urine or pesticides in the urine. They don't really have those tests available in the blood. So some of the, some of the choices really become what's, what's available as, as commercially that you can order and measure for a person, for yourself or a person. So there's more um, availability with urine testing than there's with blood. With blood, there's some testing. And then there's a difference between your toxic load, how much you have in your body versus how sick you are. Some people can yeah. have a high amount of toxic load, but their antioxidant system is really high. They don't have any reactions to it or they can clear those out pretty quickly. They can biotransform, some can't. Those levels can change over a period of time. Some people have chemicals bind to their protein and then change the protein structure, it becomes a new antigen. That's what my PhD thesis was on. I did that with fire retardants and neurological autoimmune disease. And uh, that's another mechanism. So it doesn't matter how much you, it's not about the level you have, but if the level you have becomes, binds to your protein in your tissues, like albumin found in the blood, that becomes a new antigen. So it's not about the quantitative load but it's the, amount, the immune response to it. And that has to do with immune tolerance. <laughs> in, a, in a sense, it's almost like, when I've explained it to my patients, it's kind of like thinking about, like say, peanut allergies. You got some people who just it being in the air, they can trigger a big reaction because they're so wound up. And other people are not that way to where they actually have to eat it to actually create a problem. And other people can eat it and not have a problem. Would that be a correct way of thinking about this, that you're responding to loads in a different way depending on how ramped up your body is? Yeah, to some degree. It's also it's also different though because you're, right. you're immune resilient, your, your toxin resilience can change at different times in your lifespan based mm. on your health of various factors. How much, how much antioxidant you can have, how quickly you can biotransform, how diverse your microbiome is. Like you may not yeah. react to a chemical before and then you go on antibiotics yeah. and it just wipes out your gut microbiome and now you're yeah. very sensitive to chemicals for the next three months, you know? Yeah. So it changes all the time. It's dynamic. I mean, some people have noticed that. They may notice like they use a soap and now they get a rash and then right. they don't get a rash anymore. And that has to do with your constantly uh, dynamic immune and chemical tolerance, right? Yeah, I've seen that in practice a lot where people will come in, they'll be like, I don't understand. I've been using this soap for years or this detergent for years. I never had a problem. Now I've got this rash from it. So that we see that in real life all the time. And I know in some of your courses, you also talked about like when people have toxins and they start doing chelation types of therapy, it's really important for them to know if they have antibody reactions beforehand, correct? Otherwise, it can actually be very problematic for them, right? Oh, yeah. I yeah. Mean, this, this is a lesson I learned. I mean, yeah. So, Kirk, there was, there was two times I wanted to quit practice. <laughs> oh, only two? Yeah. Only, no, for real. Two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, they were both the same scenario. And it was when I go, I'm harming my patients more than I'm helping them. Yeah. Like, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. I give up. I'm trying yeah. to learn all this. It's still complicated. I'm doing the best I can, but they're getting worse. 
and they were both chelation cases and one of them ended up walking into a wheelchair within a very few period of time during chelation therapy and i remember at that point i was working and getting to know dr Rajnani better and he's like some of the blood and he had this person had myelin basic protein antibodies and he had antibodies to mercury bound to albumin and it was like oh my god yeah and they're both igm elevated which means they're both acute yeah so we're like oh no he's like you this is the trigger like yeah. what happened we're like well he went on chelation he's like oh no so um you know, i always talk about the degree of you have to have some degree of health in order to do chelation right. like your barriers have to be intact you're hopefully not having antibodies produced against the chemical and uh, you don't have any breach in your barriers your blood brain barrier gut barrier lung barrier and then you have to have some degree of fitness so when you have these practitioners take really really sick patients yeah. if you did a heavy metal challenge test where you had me take dmps or dmsa or take anyone and, and do a challenge test you're going to have high levels of an environmental compound like lead mercury arsenic they're all going to be high mm -hmm. no one's going to pass a challenge test nobody will pass a challenge test with no chemical elevations so if you take a really sick person you give them a challenge test and they go okay it's high that's why you're sick you have high load of this chemical and then you try to detox them and they can't handle it you get people that get really really sick i think you and all of us that are healthcare practitioners, we see the, the, the people that go, I really got sick after the chelation. Like you look at their timeline. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, their doctors are saying, well, that's, that's just, you're just getting it out of your body. Yeah. And yeah. You're just detoxing. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, come on, like, give me a break. It's just, yeah. uh, we're, I don't know. I guess you have a lot of bias. Yeah. It seems like it. it I've noticed just after being in healthcare, we've been in this now, you know, 21 years. I, it seems like it becomes like religious cults in a sense. So many yeah. people get just to where this is a belief and no amount of evidence can shake you one degree or the other. And that's true in allopathic medicine. It's true in, in alternative. I see it in both sides where it becomes so emotional. Excellent. Yeah. And not logical. 100% on both fields. There's no one, no one that is more, everyone, everyone ends up with bias. Mm -hmm. Healthcare model does not, for the most part, practice evidence-based medicine. Mm -mm. They truly really do not. <laughs> no. no and, and with with that point there, that leads me to a question that Lauren has. She says, "Are there any particular journals that you would recommend for those interested in learning more about neuroimmunology?" And, and plus, you've got your great neuroimmunology course. I want you to talk about that too for the doctors that are listening uh, through the Karajan Institute. It's absolutely amazing. Like like you, everything that you do is you take these complex subjects and they're still complex, but you make it to where it's manageable, where I can navigate through it and get something out of it to where, okay, I may not master all this, but I know I can help a certain amount of patients with what I've learned so far. And every time I re-listen to your lectures, there's something new. So if you could you know, share what you got going on too with the Karazian Institute and what you've got going on for patients as well too. Sure. Um, so the answer to the question is, the question is, what's the best good neuro neuroimmunology journal? The Journal of Neuroimmunology is really good. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the thing is, is that you're not going to find most of the best neuroimmunology papers in that journal. They're going to be scattered all over. So there won't be one good paper. The best thing to do is to just learn how to use PubMed. Learn how to use what are called mesh terms for the topics you're interested in. You can find tutorials on YouTube how to do that. Once you learn how to start doing searches with mesh terms and uh, you can really start finding papers really effectively and you're going to see it's going to be spread out in multiple journals. Um, but for the Cross Institute, <laughs> let me answer that question too. Uh, yes, you know, this has kind of been my whole, after all the work I've done trying to improve my skills as a researcher, clinician and practicing, I've been practicing, like you said, over 20 years and learning how to do research and then publishing research and learning how to do data analysis and stats and research design. There's a point like, how do I merge it all together? And like, this is it. So I'm going to take all the evidence. I have my own clinical experience. And then I have um, everyday questions that come into my office. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm going to have to read up on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens. And then uh, when, you, when you spend countless hours, and I mean brutal hours doing literature reviews yeah. and pulling up papers, looking for one thing, and you read, I don't know how many abstracts to find the papers, and they read the papers, and you read through them, then you find some gems, and then you see yeah. a common friend. Then you see your common trend may have a clinical application, and then you go and apply that to your practice. That's how clinical models are developed. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of what I've done over my whole career. I've gotten more efficient over, that, over time. So I remember when I was put together at Kronzian Institute, which was this past year, I go, okay, I'm going to teach. I'm, I can probably put together three courses a year. 
what's the first one? I'm like, I got to teach neuroinflammation because it is Amazing. overlooked. Mm-hmm. And there's so much information research on it. And diet, nutrition, lifestyle make such a huge impact on it. Yeah. And people that have past head injuries that don't know they catch up with them, people that have brain inflammation, but it's the cause of their chronic depression doesn't respond to anything. Like there's so many mechanisms of brain inflammation, so much research on it and so much, well, uh, published evidence-based applications to calming down brain inflammation it was like the first one's going to be on your inflammation yeah. and i remember talking to other people and you're like why'd you pick that and i like oh, no one's gonna be interested in that i go it's just yeah. the missing link in the healthcare system <laughs> that it's huge <laughs> i i was totally thrilled i was i geeked out over like oh my god this is so great because you know i work with a lot of athletes and right. and at a lot of i played football 11 years i had at least 10 concussions you know, and then was sent right back into the game. So, and I was having some of the, you know, some of the symptoms of uh, early CTE even. So this was really important for me, combining everything you teach in there. And then I obviously also use lasers on it. I think it's fantastic, especially because I see, we see this so much online of people saying, I'm taking all the right supplements. I'm doing all the different, um, you know, gut health protocols on here. I'm not eating reactive foods, yet I can't get the gut to work. And I think the thing that's overlooked so often is the brain because I see these patients come in then and they can't swallow or I take a listen to their gut and they have poor gut motility. So if you can maybe kind of, you know, elaborate on that, on that importance there, that is, it's been overlooked. You really have been the person who brought that to the forefront. I know I wouldn't have any knowledge of it without having taken your courses in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's the same thing. Like with brain inflammation, we did another course on the gut and there's a whole section in that course where I talk about. These are the mechanisms that make the gut not respond to gut protocols. <laughs> Brain gut access is one of them. You know, intestinal amine is another one, and they're different different mechanisms. So uh, I think for the most part, there's just lots of those out there. So for me, I get frustrated. So when I look at the healthcare system, I just see most people regurgitating everyone's stuff, and that's kind of the same thing. And then, mm-hmm. and I can understand why the time and energy it takes to first of all. You have to, this is what I've learned. I remember talking to Andrea, <laughs> you know, Andrea, my wife. Yeah. I'm like, this is the deal. I was like, you can't just know research. Like you got to be trained to how to read research. Like this, actually the most important part of a research paper is the statistics section. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't know how to understand, read statistics to know the method and how they're analyzing it, what kind of method they use, what kind of confounders, that, that immediately you have no idea what the paper's about. Mm-hmm. Conclusion is the, is the, author's bias right that got through peer review it doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate and then you know most people will just go right to the conclusion so i remember like the time and energy it takes to read papers to literature review and then have actual clinical practice where you can actually see patients work them up and then put that all together i mean for me it's been over 20 years to be able to get to that point where i can finally do it and that's when i started the cross institute but even if you know as you've been to the cross institute i show real patients in my seminars i don't they're not made up they're not like theoretical and they're not like rah rah i cure them i'm the best i'm awesome it's yeah. like they're struggling this is as far as we can get or this is what we're trying this is what we're doing but it's a combination of taking a real clinical practice and then being able to actually understand research and then putting it together and that is um i think my the way i can contribute to education you know? yeah i think it's fantastic and i think every doctor that's you know listening should really take that take those courses because each one will make you make you better and you can get one course and spend months and months digesting them i still go back and re-listen to you your uh function neurology seminar courses from years ago and there's always something that i that i missed but it, it, it's interesting the synchronicity of it usually it'll be something that'll pertain to a patient that i'm working with where i've been stumped and then that will like you know turn the light switch on or there's something else that we can yeah. try to approach on there yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, there's so much information in, in courses when you put it together. And I think that's, and I think, you know, for, for, from, you know, when you're a practitioner, it's different if you're a practitioner or a patient. Yeah. If you're a practitioner, you can, you can within two seconds tell this guy's never done this in practice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right, right. It's so obvious. I mean, if you're, you know, and, and I think uh, it's the same thing when you're a researcher or not a researcher. When someone talks about research and not a researcher, you can know in like two seconds. They don't even know how to read the paper. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, we're at the point where research is coming out so quickly. And diet, nutrition, lifestyle research, especially in application, coming out so quickly that we really need to combine those two and get that information out because it's, game, it's a game changer. Like the, the stuff that I learned to do for my own patients with brain inflammation was a game yep. changer for practice. I was able to hit patients that I was never able to help uh, five years ago. Oh. Uh, same, same, like I'm redoing a course right now on thyroid Hashimoto's. I've been teaching Hashimoto's forever, but 
some of the things that I've learned the past few years and from research and papers that have come out, it's been so mind blowing. It's completely changed my model. So and, and with that, are there any kind of, you know, teasers of what people would see in your new thyroid course that's coming out? And when, when is that coming out? That's next month, correct? Yeah, it's yeah. coming out. Uh, May 15th, Crossing, I think. Crossing Institute, May 15th and 16th. We're streaming mm -hmm. it. Um, then it's on demand. But even if you miss that date, it's always on demand after the, after May yeah. 16th and 17th. Um, there's so much. I think the biggest picture is that you can't do a linear protocol. You have to put it all together, but it's also a review of all the literature. Like for me, just that something we talked about, I didn't know iodine was that much of a trigger. I was never, yeah. I've never, never done iodine elimination diets before. Yeah. Wow. That's a game changer for some people. So, yeah. especially because some people, I had a patient uh, ask me about that the other day that they wanted to do a high, it was actually, I was being interviewed in something and the person was interviewing me, said they were doing a high iodine diet for their thyroid to where they're eating a lot of seaweed. And from what I remember, Hashimoto, the researcher who named it after himself, he found that a high seaweed diet like they had in Japan was actually one of the driving factors, correct? in some of the rates of Hashimoto's over there. Am I correct in remembering that? Um, I'm not sure about that, but that sounds yeah. pretty accurate. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it sounds likely. I mean, I don't know. But I would tell you, like, also, so say that's a great example, of, like a very basic thing. I would have never done iodine elimination diet. I would just go, that's crazy. Diet needs some iodine. Yeah. When you see the evidence come out and then you've had some clinical experience doing it, you're like, oh my goodness. That totally changes persons. That was the game changer. That was the one thing that, boom, switched. And I could tell you the reason I didn't do that before because I didn't see three new studies showing mm -hmm. dramatic changes like that to, to make me like sit up and go, okay, that's, that's serious. That's, that's a game changer. Yeah. So, so like for all the people that practice with Hashimoto's, if you didn't know that, you didn't, you didn't understand that concept and you start implementing that with some select patients, it could, mm -hmm. it could change that person's physiology dramatically so they can start to calm down their autoimmunity. Um, so there's lots of little things like that, but um, ultimately at the end of the day, you're still, working on their autoimmunity and triggers. There's been a lot of new research. How do you apply the new research? Um, where do you start? Do you start with, and I think that's the biggest thing also is it's not so much what you do that's different, but the order of you do things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you just start at the gut? No, <laughs> you know, like people yeah. that function medicine, always start with the gut. You're like, yeah. you're gonna, I'm not gonna get anything done if you start yeah. with, the gut with this person. So, uh, you know, the clinical mindset of knowing where the priorities are, trying to put together the pieces it's really also more about, you know, the, the bottom line is if you, if you, and this is what happens with novice functional medicine practitioners too. If you run enough tests, you're going to find everything. Yeah. So if you do a gut panel, GI test, yeah. blood test, such a fatty acid test, red blood cell, you're going to have everything. Everything's going to be wrong with chronic right. patients. Right. That's not the skill. People think that's the skill. This, that's not the skill. So what people are doing right now is they're kind of testing everything, finding stuff, or they test things they like. They become the adrenal guy. With the heavy metal guy or whatever, right. they test everything and then they just jump into like protocol. Here's my heavy metal protocol. Here's my gut protocol. Here's my, and they just go from testing everything to a protocol and hoping that will change. That is such poor clinical practice. The the key thing is to to like figure out as a clinician how my here's a web and I actually teach Hashimoto's in this course as a web. Yeah. So I have a I have Hashimoto's brain web, Hashimoto's immune web, Hashimoto's gut web, Hashimoto's endocrine web. And I just reviewed all the literature in the past years and put it together in the web, how they all like, and they go, here's the web. And I show all these webs that are related. Then I go through and list all the triggering events for Hashimoto's published. Right. Those get fed into the web. Now you have this web and you have these triggers based on the workup that, you know, I go through. Then I go, how are you going to pull in the web to have the biggest impact on, on many parts of this at once? And that's how you choose your protocol. So, so as you become more experienced, it's not, it's really more about how do you pick the first, the best strategies, mm -hmm. manage the patient versus they have everything and you do everything because you can't do everything. No, you can't. And That's then they can have so many, I see patients come in, they say, I want you to take a look at my supplements. And I've literally had a patient bring in a suitcase and, yeah. and, and open it up. I'm like, oh my God, there's like 60 things you're taking a day here. And then some of them are just redundant because they've gone to so many different practitioners. Well, this doctor had me do this and that one had me do this. And, that's, and it's like you said, well, they went to the one who was the adrenal doc and then here was the gut doc and then here was the hormone doc and here was yeah. the this. And they have all these things that it's just, it can be overwhelming for the practitioner and for the patient alike. Yep, and I think I think that's the overlooked thing. It's not about what what's necessarily new to do. It's about how do you figure out what to do first. What do you figure out? To do? How do you figure out the priority? Yeah. Clinical priority, like with a chronic patient, everything's gonna be wrong. How do you figure out the priority of where to start and what to do? That is the game changer. That's the difference between 
a, a great practitioner and a, a novice practitioner. And I can tell you for myself, well, I can go back and look at my files three years ago, five years ago. I'd just be embarrassed. Oh, I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I totally understand because especially as I've been, you know, I try to model, I, as I, you know, I teach doctors laser therapy, I've modeled the way I do it off of what the model you've done because it's so great where you're bringing in the research and you're bringing the case studies and showing me how you walk through it. Is then as I've gone back and learning what I've learned from you and as I've been doing more research, I spend like, people say, well, what do you do in your spare time? Well, when I go to lunch, I just read on PubMed. And I mm -hmm. learned that from you like six years ago when we were at the Thyroid Mastermind Summit when I asked you, what do you do for reading? You're like, I just read journals. So my spare time I really read that stuff and I look back on cases that I'm like my god you know I completely didn't manage that as it should have been and it's, it's you wish you have a time machine to where you could go back and kind of you know redo it and do it in a better way to get that better outcome with that patient and I have in my head three names of patients <laughs> yeah exactly so I'm not joking no I believe that, you. that I saw when I was first out of school that I just wish would find their way back to me I don't know where they are in the world but mm -hmm. they would come back I have because I remember as a new graduate just failing on them so bad and, you know, when you yeah. fail, like the ones you never remember patients you have success with. Mm -mm. You only remember the ones that you just totally crashed and burned and failed with. Oh, totally. But I have these, these patient names and I'm like, please, someone in the world, connect me again with them. Because my level of understanding to how to manage your case now is so much different than before. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe one day I'll get lucky and they'll call me back up and I'm like, I'm ready for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you just, it's amazing how you're always innovating, always coming up with these these new different methods to help us all get better. Um, we did have a question pop into about adrenals. If you can, if you got time here, I don't know how, what your time frame is like for having to let you go. Um, adrenal testing, valid, not valid? What's a good way of doing it? Um, oh, adre adrenal yeah. testing is, is definitely valid. There's been okay. specificity, sensitivity, reproducible studies done on it. Uh, salivary cortisol is the gold standard for measuring gold certain rhythms. It's not serum. Um, that's just the fact. So the what testing, about urinary? Because people ask about urinary testing for that as well. Um, urinary, like by, like I think dried urine, Dutch testing, they're doing it. They did one study, published this one study where they correlated with uh, saliva. So there's been at least one study. Um, I'm not, I, I would guess that there's some, uh, from that one study, you have to understand, it was, it was done by the lab that does the testing. So you have to always look at publication bias. Um, I mean, some of that takes place because how many people are going to answer that question? But uh, I, I don't know. I'm not sure about urinary testing for cortisol levels throughout the day. Um, as far as the lab that does it, they published a study showing high degree correlation with it. So at least they had, do have a publication that uh, does support it. But, you know, if the gold standard is, is uh, saliva, how hard is it to just collect saliva? Right. So that's, that's what I don't understand with people. It's like, there is an established gold standard. Just do the gold standard. Don't try to have a lab talk you into not doing the gold standard. Like, because here's the deal. If someone's going to question that test, maybe another healthcare provider or someone else, and you go, well, you're doing a urinary cortisol? Yeah. Stating rhythm? Where's the evidence? And you're like, you don't have any. It's like you completely don't have any evidence. Whereas they go, salivary cortisol, you can find countless papers on the validity of that test. Right. So my, my answer is always do the gold standard. It's already been established. Let other people catch up to the gold standard, then prove it, then do that test. But, you know, if you were sick, you don't want someone doing some new test that the lab right. thinks the lab that's selling it thinks it's cool right you would wish they would do the gold standard on you or your loved one or something so just stick to the gold standard I, you should never deviate from the gold standard test it makes sense with that and tying in with that i've got a question asked about what about muscle testing for nutritional deficiencies or food reactions um so it's just a whole different world that's kind of an energetic world it's not you know it's uh I mean, technically, when you taste a nutrient, as you taste a nutrient, you change the frequency of firing different pathways that can change your final uh, final column pathway, your ancient horn, and bring that closer to the threshold. There's lots of theoretical models of how it can work. Um, there's different. Here's the thing. There's something. Let's say is let's say it was valid. Let's just say make the assumption was valid. Even if it was valid, and if it did, it is valid, depending on where you are. Um, what's the accuracy from one tester to the next tester. I remember when I was involved yeah. uh, talking about research for the ICAK, that was a question I had, like, well, who are we going to have? I remember the International College of Applied Physiology had a board meeting to do research. They had brought in Anthony Rosner at that time. Anthony Rosner was a PhD uh, biochemist from Harvard. He ran the Foundation of Chiropractic Education Research. And they were trying to figure out as an entire organization, who are we going to have do the test? Because who's the best muscle tester? Yeah. So if you immediately <laughs> ask the experts who they're going to ask, yeah. They already know that there's some bias in who has different quality testing and so yeah. forth. So I think, uh, I don't know. 
I mean, I've certainly seen the reaction myself when people yeah. muscle testing. Do you randomly pick out of the blue or do you muscle test? Maybe muscle testing changes from random picking versus another. Um, you know, it's funny, as more and more I've understood research design and being critical, it's like I can't stop from thinking all the different variables and confounders that can impact a muscle test. Right. So, and there's so many, it's like, how do you even design a study to account for all that? I think it's, it's hard to do. But I've personally seen people change their muscle strength with one nutrient yep. from another, whether that makes a difference or not. I remember when I was a chiropractic student, there was a guy named David Leaf who mm -hmm. was one of the best applied kinesiology yep. people. He was and quite he, a character. <laughs> he still is. Yeah. And uh, very bright guy. And yeah. he remember he was teaching a course and he had a person come up and they found all these different muscles and they came up with all the different meanings for it and all this and different things strengthened it and they came up with different meanings for like what that could be by touching different points or doing different things. And then he goes, okay, let's do this. He brought the person up. He took an activator gun, which, you know, people use yeah. for those things like a little click, click, click thing. People don't know what that is, like a device for just stretching a muscle or joint. And he took it to this guy's sternum and went tick, 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 and just beat the hell out of his sternum with the right. activator gun. Right. And every muscle that was weaker before turned on strong. And he goes, is that my therapy? Because I just fixed everything. Based right. On muscle test. So that's one thing. And I remember when I was in chiropractic school, I got exposed to applied kinesiology. I was actually the youngest diplomate. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, explored that area for a while. Well, I remember if I can interject it to the taste, you did an interpretation of my blood work back in 1996. Uh, right. if you were, like, second term and, you, and you, you were working with me on some nutritional things. I had some stuff going on with digestion and you were, you know, evaluating me. And you're like, Hey, can you get some labs run? And you gave me this list of labs. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I can go get them from my medical doctor. And I brought them back to you. And you did an analysis on me in 1996 and then told me what to do nutritionally supplements. I, and of course I was like the typical patient. I followed it for about two months and I felt great, <laughs> did well. And yeah. then went back to my old habits and right. it was a roller coaster from there off, off and on until I finally learned to, you know, actually stick to a protocol. So when I was in chiropractic school and I was in my 20s, I was exploring different things. And applied kinesiology was, was uh, pretty interesting uh, where they have people test the supplement and, and, and change it and so forth. And uh, I mean, it's still a phenomenal therapy for sports injuries and lots yeah. of fantastic things. The question always comes up is, is this a valid form of testing and so forth? And this is, uh, it will require research to actually accurately answer that. The clinical phenomenon is different than a research phenomenon and a bias phenomenon and so forth. But at the end of the day, I remember person who actually influenced me the most was Dr. Goodhart. Yeah. So when I was a student, I wrote a paper uh, and submitted to the International College of Applied Physiology. And, they, and uh, it was, you know, your muscle testing could be skewed based on the central integrative state of your brain. That your muscle test is a neurological function and how your brain is firing and what's going on with the pathway to the edge of your horn can determine the validity of the test, even if you assume that it's accurate. So I submitted this paper, and back then, if you submitted a paper, they let you speak. And the International College of Applied Physiology said, you can't speak, you're a student. But you submitted a paper. And then Dr. Goodhart came on board, and he said, let the kid speak. <laughs> <laughs> so like I got, you were, what, like, 24 at the time? 25? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really 20. So I was there, and I'm basically saying, hey, you guys might not be doing active muscle testing because the brain may not be intact, and this is my paper, and I explained it, and so forth. And after that, I got to know Dr. Goodhart, George Goodhart. And I remember sitting with him, and, and, uh, um, he, and, he, and he was there, and he goes, I never, I go, listen, Dr. Goodhart. So they invited me to be part of the board as a student member for the board. Uh, and I remember never bothering Dr. Goodhart because everyone always bothered him. He was the founder of applied kinesiology. It's a yeah. phenomenon. And, and one day he sits next to me and I go, listen, I, I, I really would love to pick your brain. I just don't want to bother you. He goes, he goes, let's talk. And he, he just, and I go, we had this discussion. I go, what upsets you most about applied kinesiology? And he goes, I hate that it's all based on muscle testing. That's what he told me. <laughs> and then he goes in my office, actually Dr. Goodhart, the founder of muscle testing is the one who got me into blood chemistry analysis. <laughs> he goes, in my office, I do, it was like 24 steps before I interpret a muscle test. Wow. I do spirometric testing. I do urinalysis. Mm -hmm. I do routine blood work. I do a physical examination. And it was never just about the muscle test. So, you know, that's the founder of the person who actually discovered this phenomenon of muscle test changing if someone tasted nutrient or something. And he was always thorough. So, 
uh, I think uh, you got to look at the big picture. You should, don't want to look at any individual biomarker or right. laboratory procedure. So it's a long answer for muscle testing, but it is. Yeah. But it makes sense. Like anything, you got to look at the art of something of, of you take all your knowledge and then figure out how to create the recipe for that individual and doing a nice thorough workup and not making them fit your model, but making something that fits what's going on with their web of physiology and, and what's occurring in them. Yeah. And you got to critically analyze everything. I think also like, what, why does a nutritionist pick one supplement versus another? Mm -hmm. How's that any more biased than someone that does muscle tests? I mean, everything no. is, we all as clinicians have a high level of bias that we just tend to forget. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, how you get treated depends on who you see. Right. And their biases. Like <laughs> if you go to the, if you're chronically sick and you go into a Lyme office, Oh yeah. You're going to be diagnosed with Lyme. Of if you're course. chronically sick and you go to the heavy metal, it's, it's pretty certain you're going to leave with a diagnosis of heavy metal toxicity. Mm -hmm. Um, if you need to go into a conventional model, very likely that, hey, you're totally healthy or yeah. you're just antidepressant. Those yeah. are, those are yes. all six, yeah. six biased models. You know? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Great point there. I have another question too from another uh, person. They're asking about what's your thoughts on 5G? Is that um, a, a legit health concern or is it overhyped? What do you think on that? If you have any kind of opinions yet? I think, I think uh, like when you look at EMFs and 5G, for, there are going to be some susceptible groups. Um, I, I remember, um, my mentor when I, so when I went to, uh, Harvard medical school, I was working at Transcend Laboratory under my mentor, Martha Herbert. Martha Herbert is a MD, neuro, pediatric neurologist and PhD neuroscientist. And he has her own lab at, at Mass General Hospital, which is, you only get that if you're extreme scientific badass, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she was, uh, she was, and she is, and, uh, she was noticing when she was doing studies on, um, brain activity with uh, kids that have autism as a primary of your research, like the EMFs would totally disrupt their brain function unrelated to just the EMF noise. And she started sharing some of this research with me. And yeah, I think, and I think when you look at neurons that are unhealthy, one of the key features of those neurons are close to threshold that they fire spontaneously with very little stimulation. So I think with people that have unstable neurons and injured neurons or lack of developed neurons, I think some of that can be a factor. In my own clinical practice, when I see a patient come in, I remember a patient coming in and go, can we do this in the dark? I had a patient come in once and we had to go to Starbucks because there was too much yeah. electrical magnetic field stimulation from my office. So we went to Starbucks and did a history. I go, we got to do the exam. Because <laughs> I go, how long does it take for you to crash? He's like, it's going to take me an hour. I go, we're going to do a 45 minute quick exam. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll talk afterwards outside the office building. But for some people, they are extremely sensitive and they tend to be the ones that have brain injuries or neurodegenerative diseases or developmental disorders. So I think there's going to be a susceptible subgroup with them. As far as all the other far-reaching things of 5G, um, I think time will tell. Uh, yeah. but there's going to be some effect, just like air pollution has some effect. 5G is going to have some effect. You know? Right, right. And is there any idea for, let's say, if someone feels like they're sensitive to that to protect themselves? Would you say it's um, just trying to make sure things aren't in your sleeping area that are generating EMF fields or any yeah, advice on that? There's some online sources where they have uh, different types of bedding you can put over your mm -hmm. uh, bed and different things you put on your computer to reduce yeah. the EMP content. You can measure. I'm not sure what the tools are, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you might have to do some of those things. Yeah. That's a question. I usually learned about those from my patients that have it. They come in and go, have this, this, <laughs> this. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. They figured out how to survive with what they just do. Oh. Yeah. No, it, it's interesting. Cause as you mentioned that I like, I'm someone who's sensitive to those things. Um, I had a lot of brain injuries as, as a kid. I got electrocuted as a kid as well too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I can, I can actually feel it, go into some place and, and feel sometimes physically ill from it. And I used to think, okay, I'm just like a hypochondriac or something. And as this thing started coming out, I saw that I do use a little device called an right. R2L, called radiation to light, the Erconia, the company that I use the lasers. They make that and I stick it on my um, cell phone and what it does is just helps to kind of convert that from uh, an EMF kind of signal into just a, a light radiation signal. So they got a little microchip in there that just collects it and then discharges as harmless light. And I found that to be helpful, um, but I even had to be careful with how I sleep. I have to, things have to be away from my bed, otherwise I'll, I'll be awake. And I used to drive Jeanette crazy, <laughs> you know, yeah. without sense to my be on that. Yeah, yeah. I have a couple other questions. Here at time, real quick. It's uh, one person asking about if whey is inflammatory, and Ray Jin also asked about A2 casein. Is that any less inflammatory? Whey is one of the most inflammatory proteins out there. I mean, yeah. I mean, so many patients, they go, they find out they're so inflamed and sick, and you go, "What's your protein shake?" They're like, mm -hmm. "Whey." You're like, "Just stop." Yep. So whey is one of the most inflammatory proteins altogether. 
And then I think too, when you look at, when people buy a whey protein, it's usually loaded with a lot of artificial sweeteners, a lot of combinations, like you'll have sucralose, acyl sulfate, potassium, and many times aspartame all combined in there as well too. So any yeah. thoughts on those have any impact on them as well? Um, I'm sure those have a trigger, I mean, have some kind of influence, for, again, for some susceptible groups, but yeah. unrelated to any, even those factors. Right. They is very inflammatory. Yeah. And, and the casein A2 that Ray asked about? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the different nice forms of casein, um, there's going to be, I think it's, it's an area of research where they're, they're finding some links to diabetes with one, you know, with the uh, one version versus the other, but, uh, there's still casein. Casein still is so, so similar as far as an inflammatory immune response, um, uh, I don't know if it's a game changer. I okay. think it's still, uh, it's still an issue. So one of the listeners is asking, what, what type of protein would you recommend in a protein powder? And I know like in some of the products you've made from Apex, you have some that are- Depends on, what your, goals, depends on what your goals are. So I remember like, so I helped develop products as a formulator for Apex, Energetics, which is a great nutritional company. But we had to take a lot of our products and take out protein altogether for autoimmune disease patients. Like you take a- protein like they had a drink to support phase one phase two liver transfer by transformation right like a liver support product and those are typically rice protein then right. we found we had to rice so we had to switch and then there's pea protein and there's collagen protein and then we had to make one with like no protein because yeah. some patient vitamin can't really handle protein um in a powder form the the process of taking a protein and converting to a powder form takes a lot of chemicals and and it does take food processing so it does change the protein. So some people that are really sick cannot take a protein powder. They're just yeah. going to have to eat real food. And I think right. with most people that end up with severe loss of immune tolerance or autoimmune disease, there, there's no protein powder for them. There's no protein bar for them. There's no protein powder for them because the way the proteins get changed through manufacturing, um, they're going to just have to eat real food. Yeah, yeah. That, ma that makes sense. And then we had that question earlier too, was asking about someone who has a if they have a thyroid cancer nodule where they have to go in and they've got Hashimoto's and they've been recommended radioactive iodine, is there any risks of that creating an autoimmune flare up um, while they're getting that type of a treatment? Yeah. So iodine, whether it's radioactive iodine or not, is going to be a trigger. You, you hear that all the time in patient histories. The question is, why are they doing a radioactive iodine test? But there's better ways to do it. So if they found a nodule, mm -hmm. they found one nodule, the question is, is it malignant or cancerous? The, just get a biopsy. You're going to have to do that anyway if the radon iodine uptake is abnormal. Mm -hmm. The only time to really consider doing a radioactive iodine test is if a person is truly hyperactive and they have no idea why they're hyperactive. There's a possibility they have what's called a toxic nodule. Okay. So when they do the radioactive up uptake, they take one single nodule, the thyroid gland gets lit up like crazy. All the dyes go in that area. Then they go, okay, the reason you're constantly hyperactive is because you have this nodule and then they know exactly what they need to remove. Okay. It'd be hard to know that without a radioactive iodine uptake test. So if that's a person in hyper and they can't figure mm -hmm. out why and they think the toxic, the toxic nodule is a cause. Outside of that, because if they're getting a the biopsy. Yeah, well, let's say if they already had the biopsy and they were going to use radioactive iodine as a treatment, that they were going to remove oh. the thyroid and then do that as a follow-up. Is there any risk for them having that as a treatment method for basically killing the thyroid? in a case like that was their question. I don't know how you would do, I, I don't, honestly don't know how you would do radioactive iodine up to, uptake as a treatment, so I can't comment on that. Okay, all right. No I just worries. know it's used for diagnosis. Okay, great. And I think, I think we've covered all the questions there, Detise, of great. what I had in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, one last one on melatonin. What, what are your thoughts on melatonin supplementation uh, for sleep? Uh, like, are there any problems with taking that? If so, what would you recommend? Or Because people have said it's beneficial for, for COVID as well, too. Any thoughts on that as our kind of last question looks like? Yeah, so melatonin is uh, something that uh, definitely works for sleep, but it has a, its limiting effects, and there's some potential triggers on the immune system or benefits for the immune system. So uh, normally when we go to bed, our melatonin levels start to go up as we, as we wake up, and that melatonin actually controls our T cells and activates our immune system and primes our immune system, which is really healthy. So it depends on how you're using it and what you're using it for. If you're using it to sleep, it's going to lose its effect on you at some point in time. So if you can't sleep well and you're using melatonin, it may be great the first uh, couple months you use it, and then it just is not going to work. Then you can increase your dose and get a little bit of benefit, then it's not going to work. So melatonin loses its effect on sleep over a period of time. And then if you have an autoimmune disease and you take melatonin, there's a chance that it can flare up your autoimmunity because it stimulates T cells. 
So, you know, those are things to, that you should consider if you're going to, if you're going to use it. The, if you're using it for sleep, you got to just go deeper and go, why do you have a sleep issue and go figure that out. But uh, I could tell you when I would use melatonin for myself, I don't, I wouldn't never use melatonin just to take it every night to sleep better because that's going to throw off my circadian rhythm and it's going to lose effect over time. But if I was dealing with a chronic infection, COVID-19 or yeah. influenza or whatever, and I just couldn't get under control, I would start taking melatonin at nighttime for that short period of time because I know it has an immune stimulating effect on natural killer cells and T cells, which you need to fight a virus. If I had an autoimmune disease, I'd be worried and I wouldn't, I'd have to kind of see how I felt, but right. that would be the only time I would personally. So short, short term and how much, how much is an approximate dosage that people might think of, of taking? I mean, uh, I think you're going to start with the lowest dose possible and see if it has an effect and kind of work your way up. Um, there's definitely going to be a point where it loses the effect. I mean, if you take too much melatonin, um, you're going to feel like you're drugged up. Okay. Yeah. Up yeah. like, <laughs> Some people so, might like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to experiment. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. I think it's like five milligram, 10 milligrams, like a starting for most okay. manufacturers yeah. and kind of work up from there. Yeah. And along those lines, I know I had uh, Steve Wasserman asked a question about like e e taking things like echinacea prophylactically versus COVID because uh, any risks with doing that? I, I don't believe so. I, and I believe echinacea has an ongoing immune enhancing effect. I don't know many studies that over time it loses effect. It's okay. just uh, it's a pretty powerful botanical. And actually it's interesting because echinacea is the least popular and like kind of boring. It's not, yeah. It's not cool. It's not like nothing new. <laughs> it's old school. I heard about that a long time ago. Yeah. But if you look at the evidence, oh my goodness. Like if you're going to put any botanical in critical analysis for the research to support the immune system, uh, don't mess with echinacea. Echinacea has got a lot of strong evidence, uh, clinical trials. I mean, it has, it, in an evidence-based model, it would make the most sense to support your immune system. Is it the best one? I don't know, but it's the one that has the most research. Gotcha. Gotcha. We did have another question from uh, Lauren. She asked about sulforaphane for neuroinflammatory issues. Do you have any thoughts on the use of that? I don't have any experience, so I can't comment on that. Okay, great. Okay, Detis, I believe we covered a lot there, man. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. And then to remind everybody, so Karazian Institute, uh, you're going to have the thyroid module is going to be May 15th. I'll put a link to that too in the comments. Yeah. So if you guys have any, um, you know, any uh, want to connect with him for that, that'd be great. Um, oh, we have one last one. Any protocol that might help with nerve damage restoration, like any kind of for, for in nerve injuries or spinal cord injuries? Are there any recommendations well, I mean, for that? Oh, spinal cord, uh, like let's say around a disc herniation, you know, anything you recommend around disc injuries? Okay, well, you, you know, if you look at the evidence, uh, laser has some evidence, so you can use laser therapy like you're an expert at. Yep, yeah, uh, exactly. Electric, anything that raises BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, so you're yeah. seeing your heart rate any kind of way will increase it. Trying to get blood flow and activation of that actual pathway that's injured will help heal it. In the literature, uh, you can look at methyl donors, methylation support, and you can look at essential fatty acids, especially high EPA, high DHA content. Those are things that would definitely be on top of the list. Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Um, like I said, his, if you guys are patients that are listening, I'll put a link in there for his 3D program, which is definitely great to do. You also have the free one at Dr. K News, which is the free yeah. tip of what to do. So right? the website for uh, patients that are interested in my books and articles I've written and the free immune resilience program that uh, is all on Dr. K News, D-R-K-N-E-W-S. So my last name is too hard to remember. <laughs> but... But I actually have my last name for the Krasian Institute, K H A R R A Z I and Institute.com. But uh, that's for healthcare professionals that want courses uh, on, on clinical models. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And then if you guys missed any portion of this, I'm going to have it posted both in my uh, video section, my personal page, and also my YouTube page. So you guys can go back and re listen to Dr. Krasian. As always, tons of information. I always learn from you every time I talk to you as well. Thanks so much for being on. My yeah, pleasure. And Thank please you. tell Andrea I said hi. I will. And you too. Okay. All right. Thank you.